Here we go. Great. <clears throat> Uh, welcome, all of you, uh, to Second Saturday Conversation. Um, it's, it's great to be with you. Um, we had uh, a little bit of technical difficulty. We may still have a few technical difficulties today. Um, I know that the link for this session um, did not uh, get out until this morning. So I'm delighted that those of you who received the link and, and have been able to show up today uh, are with us. So for all of you, this is our third year of Second Saturday Conversation. And for all of you who are returning um, and jumping aboard on our little coracle as we traverse into an ever-widening sea, um, welcome back. And for those of you for whom this may be your first visit with us, um, welcome aboard, welcome aboard. Uh, this year, our overarching theme is evolution of the word, colon, all things change. Evolution of the word, all things change. And I have taken that title from the title of one of Marcus's books, um, evolution of the word, um, the New Testament in the order the books were written. Okay. Um, so this is not um, what the book is. It's, a, it's the Bible. And then, uh, but all of the books are sequenced in the chronological order of their writing in the historical context in which they were written, uh, not in the canonical context, which is the way most of us see, or almost all of us see the New Testament, but starting with Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and so forth, okay? But in the chronological New Testament, the earliest book of the New Testament is 1 Thessalonians, written by Paul, and uh, was probably written around the 50s. Um, Revelation, for instance, which comes at the end of our canonical New Testament, that's somewhere in the middle, probably written around in the 90s, maybe in the early first, uh, uh, early second century. And the last book of the chronological New Testament is actually Second Peter, Second Peter. And that was probably written as late as 150, okay? So um, all of the 27 uh, books, documents of the New Testament are in this volume that Mark has pulled together. Um, but as I said, it's done in the order in which they were written. And that gives us a kind of panoramic view of how the ideas and stories of the New Testament changed over time. By the way, Marcus provides an introduction to each one of the New Testament books, um, and that those summaries, I, it's that's worth the price of the book. So, um, as I said, I, I I got the title for this year from that book, "The Evolution of the Word." His subtitle is "The New Testament in the um, the Chronological New Testament in the Order that the Books Were Written." And my subtitle for this series is All Things Change, Evolution of the Word, All Things Change. Um, I have already gotten a little bit of feedback from this title, uh, some insisting that there are some givens, there are some things that are um, forever uh, true. <laughs> And I will give a nod to that. I will say a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Um, but um, uh, hi, Jake. Why don't you just, um, I see Jake's name here. Jake is our new technical uh, assistant person. And uh, I'm going to introduce him in a minute. Um, but I, I will make an acknowledgement to the fact that maybe there are some things that are consistent. And I would put those under the category of the unconditional. Uh, that's a word that we've used a lot last year, thanks to the profound work of Jack Caputo. Uh, I'll say more about that in a minute. But let me introduce Jake Tiefer. Um, he is going to be handling our technical stuff today. So Jake, why don't you introduce yourself and say a little hello, Jake, and say a little bit about, um, uh, about you and, and your being on board. Uh, yeah. Hi, my name is Jake 
Um, I'm uh, taking over maybe, maybe temporarily, maybe not temporarily. Uh, we will see. Um, happy to be here. And um, it's going to be a little bit bumpy today. Uh, I apologize. I uh, just ask you guys to bear with us. And um, we will try to make this as smooth as possible today. That, that sounds great. That sounds great. And, and Jake, I mean, I'm just getting to know Jake, but Jake's, uh, when we had a couple little uh, glitches this morning, including that the links hadn't been sent out, Jake's eyes looked to me as big as our cat, uh, Marcus is my cat, Jenny's eyes, when we had the earthquake in the Bay Area in the, in the 1970s. <laughs> so it's sort of like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so here we are, and we will just move through this as, as well as we can. And uh, I'm just incredibly grateful that you're here. Um, I, I could not do this without the tech assistance. So um, uh, I, I, I need your, your help, and we will move through today as best as we can. So I really, really appreciate your being here. Hey, you're welcome. Okay, super. Great. Um, I want to, um, you can kind of focus back on me. Here we go. Um, I want, and I'm going to wait for Jake to have me on screen. There we are. Okay, super. Um, I want to begin my comments uh, today by uh, telling you a little bit about the music that I have chosen that will be prelude to all of our sessions this year, okay? Each year we've done this, uh, there's been slightly different, different music. Um, and I want to uh, tell you why I've chosen the music that I have for this year. I think that sort of the, some of the themes in the music really speak to us as folks who are showing up for Second Saturday. And I do wanna make a comment that those of you who may see this on the website and who are not with us in real time, um, that I think the music and even some of the quotes that we provide in the beginning are not provided on the website. Um, the, the music and, and quotes, those are some of the perks of showing up in real time. But even so, I want to let you know what music precedes our sessions and why I've chosen it. Um, the first song that you heard uh, this morning was The Rainbow Connection by Kermit the Frog, uh, written by Paul Williams and Kenny Asher. Um, Kermit made a, uh, an appearance last year on Second Saturday, and um, he's sort of been hanging around with me ever since. Um, I, I, I actually love the song The Rainbow Connection, and I feel a kind of affinity with, with Kermit. So um, Kermit um, is sitting in the middle of a swamp, which some of us may be able to relate to. And the songwriters consider that Kermit is like the Jimmy Stewart of the frog world, of uh, the frog people. Um, and like every frog, he's a thinking frog. And he, reveals himself as a as an introspective soul and his environment is water and air and light just the kind of environment where you might see a rainbow and his song lets us know that he is on a spiritual path he's examining life and the meaning of life and Kermit is searching for what he calls the rainbow connection, something that we'll find. You just wait and see, he says. He keeps stargazing and wondering what we might see. And Kermit in his song says that he hears something calling. And he says he's heard it too many times to ignore it. And he makes this sweet comment. He said, maybe it's the same sweet sound that young sailors hear. Well, here we are in our little coracle in our little boat. Maybe we too feel like a young sailor hearing something that calls us. So he, he ends his song by saying, well, whatever is calling, it's, it's what I'm meant to be. And he counts himself among lovers 
and dreamers. To me, Kermit sounds like one of us who come to Second Saturday. The second song that I play is Van Morrison's Enlightenment. And it's a slight counterpoint to Kermit. Van Morrison is a little more hesitant to claim that he knows what he's talking about. He's skeptical about naming the holy or naming anything as an absolute. He says, you know, chop that wood, carry water, up the mountain, the sound of one hand clapping, enlightenment. Don't know what it is. He goes on to say that every second, every minute, every hour, it keeps shifting. Now, what is the it? It keeps shifting. And then here's maybe the edge. He says, it's up to you how you understand all of this. It's up to you. You can change it for good or bad. Rearrange it. It's up to you. We may not know what it is, but we're responsible for how we live it. Wake up, he says. For those of you who were with us for last year, I'm going to make a little side comment for a minute about Morrison and Van Morrison and Kerman. In a way, Van Morrison is a kind of postmodern thinker who says, I don't know what it is. It, whatever it is, it provokes. I don't know what it is. But he responds to whatever it is anyway. But don't know what it is. And Kermit, he's a little bit more like a modern thinker. He's maybe more like a Tillich, who would say, whatever this is, it's the ground of our being. It's all right here. And we may not really know what it is, but I know, I know. I know that it's here because this is the ground of all of our being. So I, I think of Van Morrison and Kermit as also, they're kind of like us. We hear a call. We may not know what it is. It's hard to describe, but we can't help but talk about it. The third song, it stings fragile which was written in 1987. Now, the song Fragile, it was written in memory of a, uh, an American Peace Corps worker. Uh, he was a volunteer serving in Nicaragua. His name was Ben Linder. Some of you might remember that name. And he was murdered by the Contras. And Sting in this song talks about how meaningless is violence, that nothing ever comes of violence. Nothing ever could. He says, rain may wash away the blood-soaked stains, but something in our minds will always stay. And then he says, for all of those been born beneath an angry star, lest we forget how fragile we are, how fragile we are. And I imagine that that angry star is Mars, a planet, the red planet. But and uh, Mars was the god of war. So I would suggest that we are all born beneath an angry star. We've all been born into a world of violence. And we must not forget how fragile we are, even though we have remarkable, remarkable accomplishments and capacities, but lest we forget how fragile we are, that we are mortal. So nothing can come from violence. And we must not forget how fragile we are. That sounds like something that's on our minds all the time we folks who come up, who show up for Second Saturday. Uh, I wanna make another note about Sting's song. Like any great poem or story or text, it can be recontextualized. 
In other words, put in a, uh, it, it can still speak to another time and place. And Fragile is such a song, even though it was written with Ben Linder in mind, it has since become a song for environmentalists. It was dedicated to the victims of 9-11. Uh, it was performed at the um, uh, Batlacan, Batlacan, which in Paris, the nightclub, uh, where in 2016, um, 90 people were murdered by a terrorist. And Sting also sang this song uh, to an audience in Ukraine less than two years ago. So the meaning or the uh, application of the song, okay, might change over time depending upon its context. But the message is still the same and continues to ring true. And by the way, I would say that is true of a lot of texts in the Bible and the New Testament as well. They can be recontextualized. Finally, uh, I wanna say something about the last uh, piece of music, uh, the waltz that we heard. It's called the Song of Autumn or the Dream of Autumn. And it was written by uh, a man named Archibald Joyce in 1908. And this English waltz became a big hit by 1912, which is the year that the Titanic sang. And some say that it was this song that the band was playing as the ship went down. So let me quote from you from the Titanic's junior wireless operator, whose name was Harold Bride. From the aft, came tunes of the band. The big wave carried the boat off. I had hold of an oarlock and I went off with it. The ship was gradually turning her nose, just like a duck does that goes down for a dive. I had only one thing on my mind, to get away from the suction. The band was still playing. I, I guess all the band went down. They were playing Autumn. Then, the way the band kept playing was a noble thing. They were playing Autumn. And the last I saw of the band, when I was floating out to sea with my life belt, it was still on the deck playing Autumn. How they ever did it. I can't imagine. I hope that we will be like the band playing on the Titanic. That at the last, we will, as, as the liturgy of the Anglican uh, Church says, that even at our grave, we will make our song, Alleluia. As Second Saturday folks, I hope that when it's over, and we know it's over, we will sing that we were so glad we didn't miss this after all. So I wanna thank Kermit and Van Morrison and Sting and the band that played on for reminding us who we are and as Kermit says, reminding us of who we're supposed to be. So now I, I wanna make a few comments, a few introductory comments about evolution of the word, all things change. And I want to um, first make a couple of comments about um, about the New Testament and about Jesus uh, briefly. So in a sense, this is the capital W word that Marcus refers to word as a word for Bible or capital W word as a, as the, as a word for Jesus. Um, let me say though, concerning the Bible, 
that I do not think that it is inerrant, meaning it has no errors, or infallible, which means that it can have no errors. That notion of a kind of uh, a, a literal, um, uh, these are the epistema verba, the actual words of God, that, that notion is really a late development. And it, the, the notion that there was a literal biblical truth really became a preoccupation only in the 18th century. And it's interesting for me to note that it wasn't until 1978 that 200 evangelicals, um, uh, evangelical leaders came together. Theo, I'm gonna, my little pup is here. Um, and came up with the Chicago Statement of Biblical Inerrancy. That was in 1978 that really claimed that um, the Bible is something that should be taken literally. So that's a modern view. And um, it's also worth noting too that, that in modernity is also when um, historical critical analysis um, became a methodology in uh, studying the Bible, um, the contextual uh, environment that the, that the gospels uh, emerged in. And, and those two tensions between the literal understanding of the Bible and a more contextual interpretive understanding of the Bible, um, that's been in conflict throughout the 19th and 20th centuries and even into the 21st. So um, what I wanna say about the Bible is that I think that the Bible is trying to tell us something important about our lives. And that the New Testament is trying to tell us something important about the memory of Jesus and his vision of the kingdom of God, which is a poetic vision of what the world could look like if, if God was in charge and not Caesar. Okay. So I suggest that the Bible, that the scriptures are, are a symbolic way of saying something important. And to literalize those stories is to diminish them and what they're trying to communicate. I think that um, literalism has sort of hobbled the Christian message and the New Testament, not unlike how the donkey is hobbled in the poem of Denise Levertoff's that was shown for those of you who were here this morning. Um, there was a, there's an image in a poem that she gives about a donkey hobbled and he continues to gnaw on this uh, narrow piece of grass and thistle. I, I think that the way that we, if we over literalize the Bible or the New Testament, that then it becomes sort of a closed system that kind of gnaws on itself. And I, I think that the New Testament can be liberated from that kind of hobbling if we understand that the language of the New Testament and the language that tries to communicate about what's really important in our lives is a different kind of language than literal language. And I suggest that the language of the Bible is not, was never intended to be taken literally. Okay. Something else I wanna say about the evolution of the capital W word and capital W word is in Jesus. Um, it was expected by the early, very early community, Christian communities that Jesus would return, that you know, he would come again soon. Okay. And Paul, who is uh, the author of First Thessalonians, the earliest book of the chronological New Testament, said as much. And Paul and others thought that the imminent return of Jesus would put an end to the Roman Empire. But that didn't happen. Jesus didn't return in the way that they thought. And it became clear that the memory of Jesus and of his life and of his death 
and the hope that he embodied and the hope that he would return again needed to be preserved in some way. And so the stories about Jesus and the meaning of all of this continue to evolve as the church community, as the communities, early Christian communities uh, develop their identity around the memory uh, and um, their experience of the continued presence of the power and vision of Jesus. So what I think is important for us to note is that history shaped the storytelling, not the other way around. And I think that history has continued to shape the way that we tell the story um, and how to continue to have it have meaning in the midst of an ongoing history, okay? You might remember that the 20th century was um, thought to be the quote unquote Christian century. And that's why the magazine, the Christian century was so named. Um, it was established in the early part of the 20th century and called the Christian century because that's what we thought um, the world would be. This will be a Christian century. But the 20th century also brought about two world wars, Cold War, so much more, that shook the foundations of religious claims and made questionable the God of supernatural theism, the God who would be, who is all sovereign, all powerful, all knowing. All of that came into question in the 20th century because of the way that history was playing out. And where perhaps the scriptures had been thought of as a closed system of belief that would kind of affirm itself by, you know, even using Old Testament text to try to prove what was happening in the New Testament and so forth, that kind of way of reading the Bible in a closed system, that's my language. The weight of that, I think, has started to crumble the believability of the New Testament. And for all too many, the way that we conventionally talk about what is claimed in the New Testament has become unbelievable. I think that the scriptures can be uh, interpreted and understood and presented in a way that um, not only keeps them open, but also keeps the future open. Um, so I'm concerned that we not overhear the scripture stories or the way we talk about Christianity merely within propositional and confessional suppositions, okay? I mean, we, we need some of those suppositions. It gives us stuff to talk about. But I think that we are better served and Christianity is better served if we understand the stories of the New Testament as imaginative efforts to express something important about our lives and to communicate a vision of possibility, the kingdom of God, what it would be like if love was really stronger than hate or if hospitality was stronger than hostility or um, if compassion um, was the order of the day and not violence, okay? For some of us, this may sound impossible now that we're in the 21st century, but I think what the New Testament and what Jesus said is, no, no, to be in a world like that is possible. It's possible, okay? So I think that we, in thinking about Christianity in and for the 21st century, which is what Second Saturdays are about, reflecting on Christianity in and for the 21st century, how can we understand and hear anew the Christian stories in a way that speaks to the possibility of a future yet to come? 
And I think that our task is to try to discern what was stirring in those early stories, what gave rise to the stirrings about those stories, and what gave rise to Jesus' vision of the kingdom of God in the first place. I think our task is to expose that stirring and not get too hung up with doctrine and dogma. So I think that the stirrings of the New Testament and of Jesus' vision is what stirs, <laughs> continues to stir a kind of longing and hopefulness and vision in our own hearts. And I think that, um, as I said a moment ago, that if we pay more attention or are more curious about those initial stirrings, that will help to untether what I think has become a hobbled framework of understanding Christianity. So as you can tell, I am of the mind that reality, and maybe with a capital R, is really an open system and not a closed system. Now, I don't want to oppose an open system. And by the way, some of you may know much better how to define open and closed systems than I do. But I find the language of open system, closed system helpful for me right now. I don't want to make those two oppositions in too harsh a way, because we, we, need, we need the work of closed systems. We need those data points. We need those points of reference. We need those points of um, uh, traction in history, okay? So um, I'm not against closed systems, but I'm of the mind that, that that in which we live and move and have our being is ultimately an open system. And, um, and how it plays out is um, in large part, part of how we interact with our understanding of the world. Um, so I think that we live and move in, a, in an evolutionary world, okay, um, that is uh, open, that has possibilities, that has plasticity, um, that has creativity, that is uh, the work of imagination and reimagination, that our understanding and interpretation of the relationship of all things will change because everything changes of necessity and we need to change as things do. And our interpretations will change, but they matter. And some interpretations are gonna be better than others at any given moment in time. And we'll offer the best hints, uh, the best uh, interpretations uh, in the moment based on the hints and guesses that we make. So um, those ideas about all things change, the evolution of the small word word, the evolution of all of this, and the capital W word in word, Bible and Jesus, that the, that the evolution of the word that, that, and all of it will change, that we will have a different frame, a different angle of vision, depending upon what we understand and what we know and don't know. I just think that's... Uh, that, that is that in which we live and move and have our be. So for us to be too um, sure that we need to have a fixed static, uh, that affirmation is fixed and static in that way, I, I, um, I think we need to recognize the real limit of that and that perhaps affirmation is a much more fluid thing. Which brings me... <laughs> to the idea of the unconditional. Now that's a word that we um, it entertained and explored a bit last year, thanks to the work of Jack Caputo. By the way, if you wanna Google Jack, it, it's John D. Caputo. 
that's how you'll find him. And that's how uh, he authors all of his books. John D. Caputo, um, he goes by uh, Jack. So I am deeply indebted to Marcus Borg and to uh, Jack Caputo for how I am continuing to um, think about things, rearrange things, wonder about things in my own mind and heart. And I'm still learning, okay? So I'm definitely on a learning curve and I'm sharing that with you. But I wanna say a little bit about the unconditional because I will give a nod to those who say, but there are some things that are sort of consistently true or so. Let me put those under the category of the unconditional for conversation sake. And what is it? From what I'm learning from Jack and from my own sense of the unconditional, it's hope. It's the aspirational. It's our dreams that can't be held captive by the present. The unconditional is a kind of longing. I think it's what makes our hearts restless. Our, our sense that, that this, that life, that this is something of value and importance and worth and desire. In fact, Jack will refer to the kind of desire that the unconditional evokes as a desire beyond desire. The unconditional is something bigger than us. And it's in reality. It's not just a projection. It's an experiential reality. It's an experience. And we know it in what we're dreaming or praying for or desiring or affirming. We as human beings are responding to something. Kermit calls it a call. Van Morrison says, people say it's enlightenment. Well, I don't know what that is, but wake up. There's something that is calling to us. And the name I'm understanding to give to that is the unconditional, which by the way, some of us might even consider another name for God. So it is a deep affirmation about the preciousness and solid uh, single singularity of life. The unconditional isn't about rules. Now there's a place for rules, okay? And there's a place for a closed system. There's a place for forms. There's a place for the conditional. But the unconditional is something that is open and is yet to be. But we are the ones who will embody it in our prayers, in our dreams, in our hopes, in our desires. So the unconditional is what matters and what we dream is possible. Even though there is no guarantee. Okay. So let me say that by the very nature of the unconditional, it is not coercive. It is aspirational. And therefore, the unconditional does not come with a guarantee. Okay? And with that in mind, I want to reintroduce the idea of negative capability, which is a term of Keats, the poet Keats, who coined it in around 1817. He coined the word negative capability, and let, let me, let me uh, borrow from his words to define it. He says, and I quote, negative capability is to accept uncertainties, mysteries, doubts. And then I love this. He says, without any irritable reaching 
after fact or reason. <laughs> so negative capability is to accept uncertainties. Okay. This is why I'm, a, I'm connecting negative capability with the unconditional. The unconditional is a profound affirmation of, I think, what is and what is possible without a guarantee of its future. But it is the hope of the future, okay? So negative capability is to be able to accept this uncertainty, the mysteries, the doubts, without any irritable reaching after fact or reason. It's the ability to not know. It's our ability to tolerate ambiguity, to tolerate uncertainty. And, and it's not a passive uncertainty like ignorance or some kind of uh, insecurity that needs to be uh, bolstered and protected in a defensive or even violent way, or uh, it needs to be bolstered through a kind of understanding or control. But it's an active uncertainty. To be able to live and dream and even look forward without a template. So that's why I say that the unconditional requires negative capability, the ability to tolerate uncertainty, and to never give up on the dream. Don't ever give up. Come what may and keep playing the music. I think in our time, we need to develop negative capability. In addition to being constantly restless and stirred by the unconditional. I mean, we live in a time when we may say, like Yates did many years ago, that the center cannot hold. But I say that this is not only a crucial time, but our best time. Because I think that the question that's being called is Augustine's question, which we have talked about a bit in years past. What do we love when we say our love, we love our God? And of course, God continues to be a somewhat problematic symbol word but I think it still is a word that holds the unconditional. So I'm going to continue to use it. What do we love when we say we love? What do we love when we say we love our God? I think that's the question at the heart of Christianity. What do we love when we say we love our God? What do we hold of ultimate value? What are we willing to risk, come what may? So um, these are some of my initial um, thoughts about uh, evolution of the word, capital or not capitalized. All things change. And what I'm reflecting on as I think about this as the theme for this year. Now, without apology, I wanna remind people that I am not a scholar, I am not a philosopher. Um, uh, I consider myself a prompt. Um, with the winds of the age, I'm picking up on some things, this and that, certainly from Marcus, certainly from Jack Caputo and others about how to think through these things what, and what is stirring in us okay, and calls us, okay? so. Um, and and I'm, my thoughts have changed a, a lot, and they are continuing to change. So what I'm sharing with you is some things that are coming to my mind as a prompt for you. You may agree, disagree. Um, you may see it quite differently. All of that is great. What I'm hoping is that it will continue to spark a conversation about Christianity in and for the 21st century, because I still think it's worth talking about. Because I think the heart of the matter is about a future that we can't see coming, 
and actually a future that we will not be part of, but hopefully a future that we love because of our love for life, a future that we love, even if we're not part. So I would love now to uh, hear from you, um, either what's this conversation, my, my talking has uh, sparked in you, um, what this is making you think about, maybe some counterpoints to this. Um, and I'm gonna give you a, a moment, moment to just sit in the silence. I've been doing a lot of talk um, to see what comes up before we start our plenary session. But in preparation for our plenary session, let me read again um, the discerning listening guidelines that I borrow from the uh, Listening Hearts uh, Ministry program. Um, you can find these online. We also have them on the website. And this describes kind of the, uh, the a culture of hospitality and listening and speaking that we are trying to cultivate here on Second Saturdays. So uh, I'm going to, as some of you are familiar with these, there are 10 um, guidelines. I'm going to read them to you. Um, if by chance, Jake, you have these on a slide, you can show them while I read them. But um, here are the discernment listening guidelines that we are trying to cultivate as a community um, of uh, listening and speaking a kind of hospitality. So take time to become settled in God's presence. Listen to others with your entire self, senses, feelings, intuition, imagination, and rational faculties. Don't interrupt. Pause between speakers to absorb what's been said. Don't formulate what you wanna say while someone else is speaking. Speak for yourself only, expressing your own thoughts and feelings, referring to your own experiences and avoid being hypothetical and steer away from broad generalizations. Oh, thanks, Jane. I'm on number seven now. Do not challenge what others say. <laughs> These are very hard to follow, as you know. Listen to the group as a whole, to those who have not spoken aloud, as well as to those who have. Generally, leave space for anyone who may want to speak a first time, before speaking a second time yourself. And I love this one. Hold your desires and opinions, even your convictions, lightly. Now there's an affirmation of um, an open system, isn't it? <laughs> Hold your desires and opinions and even your convictions lightly. Okay. Thanks, Jake. So um, now I would like to, um, literally, I'm going to give us a minute to just sit and see what comes up in terms of your own thoughts and thinkings and wonderment and puzzlements. And then we will open up um, the time. We have a good uh, almost half hour for us to um, uh, reacquaint ourselves with one another and with this conversation that we have on Second Saturdays, being Christian in and for the 21st century, okay? So uh, let's just have a moment and see what comes up for you. I'll let you know when the when the uh, minute is up. Okay. 
it's been a minute. So um, I've actually put myself on gallery. I don't usually do this. Um, so I have a little better idea of uh, uh, more faces um, to greet this morning. So hello, folks. Uh, Jeff Creswell, are you uh, anywhere near? Are you, has Jake found you? Maybe yes, maybe no, Jeff? Okay, Jeff, uh, Jeff and Carol Creswell are very, very good friends of mine. Yeah, they, I, oh, I, I wasn't able to unmute myself, Marianne, but I just got unmuted. <laughs> that sounds like something that would happen to me. <laughs> Unmute? Don't know what it is. <laughs> so anyway, good, Jeff. Glad to see you. And, and again, to all of you, thank you so much for your patience uh, today. Uh, our link, uh, for whatever reasons, didn't go out as we normally schedule, which is the day before our second Saturday and the morning of, okay? So um, that's usually how we do this. We will uh, continue to do that. Nine o'clock is when we start taking in folks um, from the waiting room. Uh, at 9.15, we'll start our music at 9.30, the program starts. So just as a reminder. Uh, Jeff, I don't know if you've been paying any attention to the chat. Uh, I do not pay attention to the chat during the morning time. But um, looking at the chat, is there anything in particular that you want to note to start off our conversation? And I noticed, too, a hand up. Um, that's also another great way to participate in our conversation uh, during this time. Uh, but do you want to lead us off, Jeff? Sure. And I, and I would just uh, second what you said, Marianne, that if people didn't write anything in the chat, but have something they'd like to contribute, that they can um, go ahead and go down to the little reaction button at the bottom menu bar and raise their hand and we'll see that they, they will be brought to the front so that we can see that and we can call on them. So but I, I'd like to maybe start out, Marianne, yeah. with uh, a comment from Cheryl McGinnis, who had a very interesting uh, metaphor that she shared that many people responded to in the chat. Cheryl McGinnis, are you there? And in that case, you can unmute. Yeah. yeah. There, I just heard her. Okay, here I am. Okay. Ah, that's it. Um, yeah, that has been a philosophy that when you're dealing with mystery and wonder, you, you have to be firmly and comfortable in the midst with nothing under your feet. I mean, it's, uh, it makes it wonderful. I love the whole idea about this, the, the uh, interpretation and the changing of the words, because I didn't get my link. I was planning something else. And I called a friend and I said, did you get a link? Send it to me. Maybe it will, you know, and all of this frantic and I'm going, okay, well, I'll do something else. And then it, she came through and then yours came through exactly at the same time. And I'm going, We're I was all frantic this, this morning. <laughs> I know I was listening to wait, wait, don't tell me. And I said, oh, I'll have to put that on and then come back. And I said, I'm going from the ridiculous to the sublime, but I didn't know which was ridiculous and which was sublime. And so, <laughs> Yeah, invite links will go out the day before uh, yeah, for the no. next session. I'm sorry about that. That was not uh, at all, Jake. That's fun. That was my fault. <laughs> right, but it was a wonderful prompt to realize that <laughs> what's ridiculous can become sublime and just like that, and the other way around. And and you must be able to juggle it. Other otherwise, things get weird. So, wow. I just I, I love. <laughs> I, I love what you said from the sublime to the ridiculous and back again and back again. Yeah. The, uh, with the other is the outrageous and, and the, ex and the elegant. Yeah. That's uh -huh. another way to put it. There was a Zen thing is outrageous between you live between the outrageous and the elegant. And I love it. And I think indeed you've just put it so well, we do live in between. Yes. Yeah. Tension of those things. You yeah. know, we're not really over here or over here. We live yeah. in the tension of those things. So anyway, I love it. I love it. And I'm incredibly honored that you chose Second Saturday conversation over wait, wait, don't tell me. Wait, wait, don't tell me. It was like it just like, well, they're the same thing. And they're both I can get later. So <laughs> that's brilliant. That's great. That's I put the vacuum, I put the vacuum away. So <laughs> Cheryl, thank you so much. That's just great. And what I also love about what you've identified, I mean, it's got me laughing. You know, I tend to be a little bit serious, but we we need to laugh through. I mean, there is something about humor and about mm -hmm. a wink and a nod and about being able to sort of dance the light fantastic with a little bit of levity that I think is really 
important. So thank you, thank you for that. <laughs> My pleasure, yeah. thank you. The, thank the, you. the phrase that Cheryl had that so many people responded to was being comfortable with one's feet planted firmly in midair. Ah, ah, good. I'm gonna jot this down, planted firmly in midair. Mid air. I love it. I Marianne is also Marianne. muted right now. Been muted all of a sudden. That that's my fault. Sorry, technical issues, Marianne. Oh, with you. <laughs> I muted you on accident. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's all right. Actually, I'm surprised that somebody else didn't do that. I, I suppose that any one of you could mute me at any time. So thanks for listening to me and bearing me out. <laughs> okay, carrying on. Let's let's go to Eileen, who's had her hand raised. Eileen. Thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, Marianne, I love these. Um, so I am a Presbyterian minister. I've been ordained for over 32 years. I've had lots of different ministries but what I want to share is comes out of the wonderful chat remarks about um, images of God. Does God change? Yes, God changes. Our images change. No God. You know, when I was a teenager, I had the, the gift, the incredible opportunity of being in a seminar privately taught where we read in different religions and philosophy and psychology, led by a psychiatrist, actually. Um, and the question was, what's the most excellent life you can live? And the invitation was to draw from the different philosophies, from religion, from psychology, and notice what grabbed you. Um, it was my introduction to the idea that I could actually craft my life, that I could uh -huh. create my life. Uh -huh. And <clears throat> one of the things that was part of this was the idea that, um, and I think it goes back, but when I researched it, St. Anselm, and the ontological argument for God, okay. that God is that than which no greater can be conceived. Mm -hmm. So as a teenager, I got permission to create God as the best that I could imagine mm -hmm. and, and keep that, the, the best love, the best goodness, the, 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 just the best, the best, the best, the best. And my wanting to be a minister it took me years to sort this out and put it in words was my commitment to stand professionally for the best that anyone can imagine. And as a minister to, to do that, and I call that God. And I talk to God, I, you know, uh, God shows up for me in lots of different ways. Supernatural, trees, that moment of transformation between people. So yeah. I wanted to share that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Riley. you. And and I and I do think that however we define God, I do think it's very relational. It has to do with how we are in relationship to our life and lives and our being. So I think that it's very relational. I think that we tend to make it anthropomorphic, but I think it's uh -huh. very, very relationship, relational. I agree with you. And I, and I also you. love what you're saying about, um, you know, sort of Anselm's the ontological thing that, you know, God is, is, is in a sense more than you can imagine. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and as um, Jack has said that language about the, let me call it the holy or the sacred or what you're talking about, it can't contain what it can't contain. Okay. Mm -hmm. So our language uh, can, uh, can point the way or can shimmer or sort of try to reflect it, but it can't contain what it can't contain. But that, mm. that, that limit is not a negative thing. It, it, for me, mm. that's even more affirmation. <laughs> you know, so I mean, and I love the fact that your own call to ministry was because you were stirred 
by that sense mm. of, you know, what William James might call the more, what we might call the unconditional, mm. what we might call God, Aww. you know, mm. and to affirm Thank that, you. you know. I do. If I'm Thank hearing you so much. That that's, that that's, that that's what stirred in mm. you that was part of your own call. Yes. And I so appreciate that you keep growing, Marianne, so publicly. It's really beautiful. I appreciate it a lot. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, Sharon Sanderson has her hand raised. Sharon, do you want to unmute yourself? Thank you very much. I often think of a very strong similarity between Jesus and Don Quixote. Huh. Both men um, envisioned a, a world of high standards and honesty and sharing and you know and all of all of that good stuff. Um, and both were thought to be a bit off their rockers by people <laughs> of their time. Uh, but it shows. Um, what we've been talking about is that Jesus had one vision and Don Quixote had a slightly different vision that it, that our vision of, of God and the kingdom does evolve. Right. Right. And, and what, what I love about what you're saying is that they both Jesus and Don Quixote felt that it was possible, that it's possible, even though we might think, ah, it's impossible. Yes. But what, what we're hoping for is that the impossible will actually is possible. Yes. So the impossible of the kingdom of God, which we may never completely fulfill, but our hope is that it, it we think, you know, but it is possible. And I think Don Quixote with his vision, it's, it's possible. So, I mean, I'm sort of playing with those ideas too of the impossible and the impossible is what keeps our hearts restless. And, and heaven forbid that they should stop being restless because I think that means we're dead. Oh dear. Uh. You know, I mean, if the heart stops, that's what I'm getting at. <laughs> so I'm all for the restless heart because I think that it is respond, it stirs in response to what you, you two have already been talking about. Mm. Mm. Anyway, just a thought. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, thanks, Sharon. Thank Peggy Matthews had a comment in the chat, uh, a question, really. Peggy, are you there? Yes, and <laughs> my question came what? out. Is, uh, can you hear me all right? Yeah. Okay, my question came out as, um, oh my goodness, that, that looks very confusing. Well, my question was confusing anyway, but I didn't type it, <laughs> it didn't come out the way I thought it was going to. And that is that I would like to understand um, whether or not the unconditional and the conditional with their tensions are the same as the tensions in the closed and open systems. Are those the same? I, I would think that they would be, but my struggle would probably be, what's going on here? <laughs> uh, right, that's the question. What's going on here? <laughs> oh, goodness. I, I really, uh, Peggy, I really appreciate what you're saying. There are those in this group that are uh, know more than I do about this stuff, but I, I really like your suggesting that the conditional um, is is reflective of a closed system, which and we need that. We need form. We need form. Okay, so there is something to be said about form and closed systems. As I said, it gives us traction in history. Right. But the unconditional, as I'm trying to understand it, is perhaps something that, and again, I, I borrow from Jack, who also borrows from the scripture, that I has not seen nor ear heard. But that it is, it is, it is, and Jack uses this language too, it is still the 
to come. Yeah. Okay, but 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 I don't want us to think that that means it's nothing. I mean, no thing in a Zen sense, maybe, but but that it's it's you know how language just fails me. But that 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 we are that we're responding to something. That this isn't just a projection that we hope things are going to be better. But that that we're, there really is a to come that might be better. Yeah. Oh, and that must be where the sense of hope then. Oh, I think that's correct. And for okay. some, the unconditional is, is all about hope. It's the to come. It's what's possible. And what we might say, ah, that's impossible. You know. So that so, when I recognize... That's the, open, that's the open system. That's, okay. That is okay. constantly seeking and longing for and um, hoping that there will be, that the future is to come and that it will be better. That's an open system. The closest the clo we see is uh, I'm worried. Oh, okay. I'm really worried. But I think that if indeed we live and move and have our being in more of an open system, then there are possibilities that maybe we have not dreamt of yet. And I'm not, I'm, I, I don't want this to be a replacement for an, a non-interventionist God. So I'm not trying to make the unconditional the, the next best answer to a non-interventionist God as though, well, but we have the unconditional. But I do want to play with that idea of possibilities. Even though there's no guarantee. Mm -hmm. But that's that's the, I think that's the edge that we, that that's what makes us say, so what's going on here? Yeah. Because I think our mortality is part of what and, and most of us in this audience, we're getting closer. We've always been close to it, but now we know it in a way that is, because uh, we see friends of ours who are, they've died, they've, they're gone. So mortality has a very different, it's not just an idea. And so I think that that underscores the preciousness and the singularity of life and how important it is. And as Sting says, how fragile we are. And so what is this? You know, I don't know that we really know. But as has been said by many others, the fact that we are here at all is um, what I'm taking. That's where my wonderment is. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. How we got here? Don't know. <laughs> what does it mean? I don't know. You know, don't know <laughs> Right. But the fact that in a sense that we are here at all and even talking about this stuff, that's my wonderment now. Okay. If, if that's, that happens. Yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very Thank much. You. Uh, Jennifer Maluski has Thanks, her. Yes. Jennifer. Can you. Oh, yeah. great. I'm unmuted. Terrific. There you go. So, yeah. So, um, I, I wanted to articulate a connection that I see um, between this all things change subtitle and the how fragile we are theme. Ah, okay. Um, so and this has to do with a couple of things that took my spiritual formation. Uh, so there's a, a story of uh, that I may have spoken on this forum before it's a, a buddhist story about how um uh, mara the evil one is walking in the world and um and it, someone has has just discovered a truth and someone says to mara you know doesn't that make you upset and mara says no no there's usually right after that they make a belief out of it <laughs> so you know and I'll just connect that up to when I went to college was the first time that I had really had deep encounters with people who had been brought up in different religions than I had. Um, yeah, you know, I was raised United Methodist. And so I was meeting some very devout Catholics, you know, not the, it's all Christianity, but a very different flavor of Christianity for me. And, you know, and I was uh, meeting some, um, some people who were Jewish and I was, you know, just like, re you know, and I, um, met one friend who dived deep into the Zen center in the town that I was in. And I, I came up with, wow, you know, 
I can get the validity of all of these systems, they're profound. Mm -hmm. You can dive deeply, deeply into them and there is enough there to hold you up. So, and, you know, and I ended up thinking, you know, so and, and I was exploring, I'm like, well, could I ever be Buddhist? You know, could I be Jewish? Could I like, you know, and I thought, I ended up thinking of my own religion as almost something that like I had, I had been born into it. And then I had imprinted on it like a little birdie. Um, and that Christianity would always be home to me. Um you know, not that it was more valid than anything else necessarily, but it was more valid for me because it was home for me. And, you know, and I can just completely express the truth of it without saying that it is the truth. Right. Um, so that's a paradox. <laughs> um, or a and, paradigm. <laughs> well, speaking of paradigms, um, where this connects for me is um, uh, Danella Meadows is a, um, a systems theorist, and she's talking about places to intervene in a system, and way up top in the most powerful places to intervene in a system are the paradigmatic ones. So shifting the paradigm, but higher than shifting a paradigm is the ability to kind of recognize your own paradigm as a paradigm. Uh -huh. the ability to hold things lightly, even the truths that you have. Right. And this, I think, is what enables us, like, like the, you know, when I get in conflict, you know, and particularly with people articulating a, 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 a flavor of Christianity that I take issue with, um, you know, then all of that stuff about holding things lightly and not being right and there being mislike, that all goes out the window, man. Yeah. I am with my truth. <laughs> so yeah. so it I think it it is recognizing, okay, I can fully sing my song. And in fact, it is in, it is incumbent upon me to witness in this way, to sing the song I have to sing and recognize that others have a different truth that I do. Right. So, you know, and that like that's the and that's the the thing that gives any hope in the how fragile we are. Uh -huh. You know, yeah. that's the thing that gives that is the way out of violence. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to articulate that connection that I see. Wow. Wow. Yeah, Jennifer, thank you. Um, I, I, I that's a wonderful connect to make. And um and by the way, I, I agree with you about that the accidents of our birth is often what determines what uh, cultural or religious framework we consider home. Mm. And so um, if I were, you know, born in a, in a um, you know, in, a, in an Islamic culture and raised in an Islamic, I'd, I'd be a Muslim. You know, and, you know, the fact that Christianity was sort of the, uh, actually, I was born in a Muslim country, but the fact that I was in a Christian environment, I, I'm Christian, you know, so I agree with you about the accidents of birth, and that rather than that relativizing what's important and what's not in a negative way, it, it kind of, um, how do I want to put it, it, it levels the playing field, though, a bit. Hmm. And, and I, uh, I love what you're saying that for us to claim an absolute truth, especially if we do so with a violent in, um, insistence, that's just completely contrary to what I think the heart of all of the great traditions point to. Um, and yet we must passionately sing our song. I love it. Krister Stendhal, who was a bishop of Sweden, said, we, we should sing our love songs to Jesus without abandon or with abandon. But that doesn't mean that we speak ill of other people's songs. So Krister Stendhal said just exactly what you did. Yes, yes, we must sing our love songs with abandon because there are love songs. Mm. Mm. You know? And yes. I love what you're saying about paradigm. And I will uh, try to follow up on that. And please feel free to share more of your understanding of that 
as you know, in our continuing conversations, because it's really helpful for me. Mm. So I really, really love what you've said. It's just struck me that in the grappling with the conflicts that I have inside of this gives me the opportunity, like that's where I find the opportunity, some of the opportunities to be the kind of Christian that I say I am. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to go back to the chat, Marianne, and a comment Mm -hmm. Joe Allison about scripture. Joe, are you there? I guess not. So well, let's let's move on to Kathleen. Kathleen Castellan has her hand raised. Kathleen, can you unmute yourself? You're still not you're still not unmuted, Kathleen. Down down in the lower left hand corner should be your little mute button. Is is it a little microphone? Yeah, it's a little microphone. Little mic with a line through it. If you tap on it, I think it'll open up. Possible. There we go. Okay. Um, it occurred to me when we talk about the word with a small w. How different our understandings can be in different languages. I have a dear friend who is a Swede who has been a missionary and has taught Thai people in Greek, etc., <laughs> Indian people. And his understanding of the Bible is always to go back to the original. Lately, he found something that has changed my idea of the feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the 4,000, as being parables that teach us to share. Okay unequivocally. It's an addition. The Swedes, I should say, are putting out an entirely new translation as we speak. First one in 500 years. He discovered that the term for the plate, the basket in which the leftovers are gathered in the feeding of the 5,000 is a Jewish basket. Clearly, whereas in the feeding of the 4,000, the basket is a different type of basket and it was used by the Gentiles. So he's 80. And has come to a new understanding that perhaps what that story was about to the first hearers was that Jesus wanted everyone fed. Everyone. I just loved understanding Uh that. Okay. That's all. Yeah, very, very interesting. Very interesting. (laughs) Um, you know, and that that particular detail about the basket might hold a symbolic meaning, you know, mm-hmm. and, and this, this shows the importance and the challenge of interpretation mm-hmm. and the art of interpretation and mm-hmm. what it's, who do, who do the interpretations serve and how does it serve the story and how does it serve us? So um, I, I, I really appreciate, I mean, I, I didn't know that about the sort of the technical differences of those words, but it's very, very interesting. And, I, and I'm with you. I'm sure that Jesus wants everyone to be fed. Yeah. Everyone. Yeah. Well, then and instead now. Instead of arguing about. Then and now. Because was this possible? Yeah. Yeah. But remember, these are, I think these are symbolic stories. Mm-hmm. To talk about something that's important. 
and yeah. you just uh, help to open up the story so that it is indeed a story for everyone. Mm. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. Uh, Jill had had a comment about um, the limits of language. Jill, are you there? He was, there's Joe, I see him. Hello, Joe. Yes, uh, it occurred to me that when we're talking about living in this mystery, that our experience of God and how we understand God and try to convey it, that, that understanding and that experience to someone else is really limited by our vocabulary. Mm -hmm. Because there are some things which cannot be said in words and I, I find that musically, you can, uh, you know, some of the great composers can take a feeling and put it into something that goes beyond words. And I think that is why hymn singing and melodies and things like the Bach B minor mass or the Foray Requiem or the... Uh, Benjamin Britten Tadeum, uh, mm, lovely. Or especially for me, Samuel Barber's Adagio for Strings, which has been uh, taken by a British composer, and all he sings is um, Agnus Dei over and over again to the it and things like pieces from Finlandia or the Norwegian national anthem being Norwegian, you know. They speak to me in something that is beyond words and gets me right to the core. And I think it's like, I, you know, I can't, I can't really explain it to you. So I guess my fumbling for the right words demonstrates what I think, what I'm trying to convey that language is sometimes limiting and you have to be outside of language, which sort of binds you to a certain way that is more narrow than the overall expression that you are trying to describe. Hi. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jill, I just, I, I think that's so uh, helpful and wise. Um, and again, that's understanding the, the limit of language, right? And that the language of art or music or whatever, as you said, it, it it strikes us at a deep, deep place. And perhaps in ways that even our kind of language, uh, you know, uh, discursive or, or even poetic language can't touch. So I, I think all of that speaks to <laughs> what it is that we're trying to speak to and can't speak about. But what's lovely is that we, I think we're all nodding at, yes, I know what you're saying. Yeah, it, it transcends language, it's like being I know I've had these mystical experiences where uh, I was at the University of Arizona in their natural history museum. And I walked into a room that was filled with ancient Native American pottery from the seven, eight and nine hundreds. And I felt this overwhelming sense of connectedness okay. because these people created something with their own hands without words, which gave me a feeling and understanding for, for what their life was like. It was word, wordless, it was an object, but the way my brain conceptualized this broken piece of pottery that was put together by someone else so I could get some feeling for what they were going through, it, it, it just, was yeah. totally remarkable. And I would suggest that where you felt and experienced that was not in your head. No, it, was, it, was your, a it was a total your body, body so. experience. Correct. Right, right. And, and I love that you, you felt something, you were overwhelmed by it. And I, I think that's the stirring that I'm kind of uh, curious about, that something stirs us. And, and I, I'm sort of putting a lot of that under the, or some of that under the category of the unconditional. Yeah, it's like looking at the stars on a clear night and being overwhelmed by the immensity of the universe and realizing that you are one small speck 
Yeah, it's amazing. In the little part of the universe that you yeah. in, inhabit, you are probably an important person to all those around you without right. even realizing how yeah. important you may be. And I think that's why it's very, very important that we see the creation, mm -hmm. the mystery in somebody else and realize that we are this connectiveness mm -hmm. that we are experienced with others. And when you lose that connectiveness, the whole thing falls apart. Right. Well, that's when we feel alone and, yeah. and just, you know, thrown into existence without relation. And that's a hard feeling. That, so that is pure hell. Yeah. And, and when, you know, I mean, all, you know, so many of us are, are in the older cohort now. I, I hope, though, that that sense of connectedness or that sense of sort of wonder or, oh, my gosh, you know, that we're here at all. I, I hope that's satisfying to us. Yeah. And, and, and when you see your grandchild, you know, you realize that somehow this feeling is being passed on. Yeah. And, yeah. and see the wonder as they explore their world. Right. And as I said, I hope that, you know, as I'm going to put it in a funny, I hope that that's enough for us because I think that's it. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. um, anyway, thank you, Joe. I, I very much appreciate what you're saying. And, and that, you know, that there are language uh, games, it's a, it's a phrase of Wittgenstein's, but that there are different language systems for different contexts and and that what we're talking about really that it's beyond a language game in a way <laughs> so anyway thank you joe we probably have a a minute maybe before another before i want to move into a close or yeah. what, what yeah. do you think well, uh, it's so hard marianne there's so many things going on in the chat and we have four people with their hands raised but i'm gonna i think i'm gonna let sheila richards give the last word with you before you close sheila sheila you're still muted well i there you go there you go oh there now i we're okay right yep. you can hear me yep i love it we're okay right i would say yes sort <laughs> of pretty much <laughs> this we're that okay. we call god transcends language and in the chat, there have been many questions about that as well. Uh, I'm a firm believer in the statement, uh, Moses said, who are you? And this that we call God said, I am. And about three verses later says again, I am, this is who I am forever. And don't mess with this. But human beings being creative and curious and wonderful have messed with it forever. And, and because we have to have a name. The thing that I remember most from last season and that I have written and that I've preached and pe I, I'm a retired Methodist preacher, but I um, uh, facilitate study groups. And so now I often offer a prayer and, and it's hard for people to grasp this. Jack said, Jack Caputo said, I think in the session on prayer, we pray to the unknown and the unknowable. And that's, that's what we call God. But we don't, we don't want to do that. So call God, I guess, what you wish. I mean, I have no problem with that. But for me, it's like the woman who was planting her feet in midair. <laughs> yeah. It's so freeing to yeah. think that this is unknown and unknowable. And then I'm reminded again, I can't quote chapter and verse like some people, but somewhere in Corinthians, Paul writes, and he's writing to them. So we're appropriating the words for us. Sure. We are stewards of the mystery. Yeah. And that is indeed who we are. Uh -huh. And this that we call God is unknown and unknowable. And that's freeing to me to the point where I get goosebumps telling you. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, th thank you. And I think that Jack would say that the prayer to the unknown God is the best prayer. <laughs> For the very reasons that you're saying. It's okay. how I begin. Oh, Holy One, unknown and unknowable. We come to you today. Ta -da 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 -da. Yeah. Yes, indeed, indeed. Thank you, Sheila. Thank mm. you. So, oh my. And let's turn it back to you. Okay. Jim, hi, I see you there. And I just want to acknowledge you and say hello. All right. Nice to have nice to have you back. And I know we're running out of time, but I'll look forward to hearing from you next time, hopefully.
So um, let me, um, in closing, a uh, uh, couple things. Uh, our next session will be October 8th, second Saturday in October. And what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to tell a little bit about of my story and how I've changed. Okay, so I'm I'm going to share a bit of my story because what I'm uh, and we will have some guests this year, and I'm asking them also to talk about how their understanding has changed about Christianity, their relationship to it, their own understanding as. Um, uh, you know, uh, of our lives. Um, in, no, in November, Brian McLaren will be our guest. He oh. has uh, recently written a book called Why Be Christian. Um, so I'll say more about Brian next time, but in November, he will come and share some of his story. In January, Barbara Brown Taylor, who um, is beloved and uh, also uh, gave the homily at Mark, at, my, at Mark Borg's, at my husband's funeral. Um, in January, Barbara will come and talk about how she sees things. In March, um, a, a scholar named Brandon Scott, who's a Pauline and parable scholar, <clears throat> will do the same. And then I'm looking forward to having Jack come back uh, this year as well. Uh, I will say more about all of that as the time comes. Um, on the 15th of October, and I, again, I'll send you an email about all of this, but we're, we'll have a third, an optional third Saturday on the 15th of October. And that's for those who want to have an um, opportunity to share in a small group. And my invitation to you will be to share about your own story and how you're changing and how you've changed. So the groups will really be small. They'll probably be of three people. And, but that'll give you an opportunity to share a little bit amongst yourselves. Uh, you'll, I'll repeat all of that in an email. <clears throat> Let me mention that I think it's, it's a psychologist who knows about negative capability talks about the importance of embracing ignorance. He says, suspend judgment, sit with doubts, question assumptions, and revisit ideas. Well, in telling my story, I was told just the opposite. You know, don't embrace ignorance. Don't, you, you know, make good judgments. Don't sit with your doubts. Do something about them, you know. Question assumptions, no, come up with answers, you know. So the, the notion of negative capability invites us to reflect in a whole different way about our stories. And um, so I'm going to give it a shot uh, and, and reflect a little bit about my own next time on October 8th. Um, I want to close with a, uh, a poem. We'll, we'll post it at the end. It's by uh, William Stafford, who was a poet laureate, um, Oregon poet um, uh, here. And oh, thank you, Jake, you put that up already. Um, and let me just read it to you because I, I, I really appreciate this poem, but at the end you will see that um, William Stafford talks about, don't let go of the thread. And I would like us to think about this poem in terms of the thread being the unconditional as we're trying to uh, talk about it, explore it. And at the end, he says, don't ever let go of the thread. Well, I would like to think that that thread or that unconditional that is part of the weave of our existence will never let go of us. That's my hope. So the way it is, there's a thread you follow. It goes among things that, that it, I'm sorry. It goes among things that change, but it doesn't change. People wonder about what you're pursuing. You have to explain about the thread, but it's hard for others to see. While you hold it, you cannot get lost. Tragedies happen, people get hurt, or die, and you suffer and get old. Nothing you can do can stop times unfolding. But you don't ever let go of the thread. And I returned to that poem of Bill Stafford's with the unconditional in mind. Um, Jake, come back to me, and I'm going to... Um, let you know what the closing music for today is. 
Um, I am playing from Bobby Dylan's 1964 song, The Times, They Are a-Changing. And he says in it, admit that the waters around you have grown. Keep your eyes wide, he says. The chance won't come again. Heed the call. Don't block up the hall. Your old road is rapidly changing. The order is rapidly fading. Please get out of the new one if you can't lend your hand for the times they are a changing. And I consider this good news that the times they are a changing. It affirms what I'm talking about as an open system. It affirms the possibility of a better future to come. And we can participate in it or not.